Hey, welcome to the last Sunday in April, which is Worldwide Pinhole Photography Day. This is a day when a lot of people who normally don't work with pinhole photography throughout the rest of the year decide to try their hand at it, either by putting a digital camera, uh, taking the lens off and putting a pinhole body cap, or using a little 35 millimeter camera that uh, they've replaced the, the glass lens with a pinhole or some kind of a dedicated uh, custom-built pinhole camera or box camera. Um, I've been a pinhole photographer for several decades, I would say since the early 1990s, but in the last few years I found myself not doing very much pinhole photography for a variety of reasons. And so I thought um, today uh, during pinhole Worldwide Pinhole Photography Day, instead of me going out with a pinhole camera and making some pinhole images, still images, I thought that I would uh, take this Lumix G5 camera, take the glass lens off. This is the 20 millimeter f1.7. I'm going to take the glass lens off and I'm going to put on to this camera body this uh, Wanderlust um, pinhole body cap. Let me see if I can take it out of here and show you. So it is a plastic micro four thirds body cap that has a recessed pinhole. So this is the front of it and the pinhole aperture is recessed in the back so that it, the pinhole is very close to the sensor and so it gives you a really wide angle of view much wider than you would have if you had a normal body cap and flush mounted the pinhole on the front of it. So I'm going to mount this to my digital camera and I'm going to take this camera and I'm going to uh, set the ISO all the way up to 12,500, which I'm going to have to do in order to get uh, any kind of a, of a decent image out of it. And uh, I'm going to go talk about my past experience with pinhole cam, with pinhole photography, what happened during that journey, and uh, maybe what I can do in the future. So please stay tuned. The thing with my pinhole photography is it started way back in the early 1990s when I had just got married, I got a house, and I finally had a room for a proper dark room, and also had a good job. And I started doing black and white silver gelatin photography, and this eventually led me to wanting to play around with pinhole cameras and paper negatives because they're kind of darkroom hands-on intensive and I had the means to do it and I uh, worked with pinhole off and on for by myself working in silent if you will working in alone for maybe 12 years before I ever uh, got connected with an online community of pinhole photographers And then sometime around 2006 or 2007, I think it was, I discovered this online discussion forum called F295, and it was dedicated to pinhole photography. And it was started by a, an artist in the Pittsburgh or Philadelphia area named Tom Persinger, and the name of the website was based on his first pinhole camera, which had a vocal ratio of f295 but I soon became fixated on on this online discussion forum this community of adepts and it changed my pinhole photography uh, in the sense that now I started doing pinhole photography in order to get reactions from uh, from the community on F-295 and so instead of me doing it for my own self for my own creative reasons I was doing it more to get attention and to get recognition and to get my ego stroked
There's both a good thing and a bad thing about an online community, whether it's uh, Facebook or Twitter or YouTube or a discussion forum of some kind. But it is important that we do have uh, a community of like-minded people uh, that are relating to what we're doing as creatives. I think that's very important. But the danger of doing it online is several fold. First of all, you have the problem of you don't really know who you're talking to. Now I always tried to make sure that whatever discussion forum I was on, I always used my real name as my username. This way when people were talking to me, they were they knew who they were talking to. I didn't come up with some stupid word like raspberry milkshake or whatever for a username that seems intentionally cryptic in order to hide your identity because the whole point of, of an online discussion forum is to share what you're doing and you can't really do that if you don't um, you can't do that effectively if you don't represent yourself as a real person so there is this problem on discussion forums of people wanting information but being unwilling to share who they really are and what they're doing in their real lives and then secondly you have a lot of comments that end up being very e ego stroking they they give you a lot of short-term satisfaction when people really love the image that you posted and it ends up motivating me in the wrong way and it, it motivated me on f295 to to see how clever I could be, to see if I could be an expert in certain technical aspects of pinhole photography. And I ended up not really doing uh, pinhole photography for myself anymore. I ended up doing it for uh, positive reactions on F295. And the problem was that eventually that discussion forum dwindled away and essentially died, which is where it's at now. Technically, the website is still active, but it's still online, that is, but nobody's using it hardly. So the problem is once that online community kind of collapsed away, I found myself lacking the ability or the desire to do pinhole photography because I, I had, my motivation had changed. I wasn't doing it for myself for, for many years. I would say for almost a decade now, I've been engaged in pinhole photography more as an ego stroking adventure for myself based on feedback on the internet and uh, I really need to get back to a place that I was at before I discovered online discussion forums back in the late 90s and early aughts when I was doing pinhole strictly for my own pleasure and my own joy and I think the key to that is all based on the finished print in hand The problem with doing pinhole photography online is it's very easy to, in the case of paper negatives, to simply scan the paper negative and invert the tones in Photoshop as a digital positive and post it on the internet and never actually make a positive contact print in the darkroom onto silver paper. This is the other problem I had with my involvement with an online discussion forum for years is I ended up not making very many prints so I wasn't doing the print in hand thing which is really the finished work of photography the writing with light it's not really finished until you have a print on paper in hand and so this is one of the things that led me down the road of getting involved with using Harmon's direct positive paper it was a more immediate way of getting that print in hand because the print itself is exposed in the camera but I really think that the the tonal range of paper negatives is a little bit better and more easily controllable than it is with Harman direct positive paper but I really need to get back to the place where I'm doing contact prints and uh, with with pinhole photography and um, this is going to be the way forward and I think that this worldwide pinhole photography day which for me the last few years has become nothing more than kind of a memorial to 
a once creative pastime that I no longer am involved in. It's kind of an annual remembrance of a dead pastime. And so I'm hoping that I can revive that in some new way for myself as a creative person. And that might involve uh, working on projects, getting a body of work completed that I can then put out into a more traditional venue, either as a book or in a gallery space, which I've never really done with my pinhole photography, even though a lot of people over the years, friends and relatives, kept telling me, Joe, you ought to do something with your work. You ought to get it in a gallery or something. So this is really the motivation. Pin Worldwide Pinhole Photography Day is just a kick in the pants for me that I really need to start doing something with my creative abilities here. The thing about pinhole photography that fascinated me was that you have this nearly infinite depth of field and the camera is nothing more than an aperture or a hole that lets light in and so the light comes in the case of daylight 93 million miles from the sun from the fusion furnace passes through our atmosphere reflects off some object in the landscape and that reflected light passes through the air through the little hole in the in the pinhole camera and impinges itself upon the film or, or photo paper in the back of the camera or in the case of this camera the digital sensor and it's unmediated light it's light that hasn't been touched and that that's what makes the pinhole image possible it's the only part of the uh, the light field that hasn't been touched or stopped or modified in some way that little bundle of light going right into the hole. And so it's kind of unmediated in a sense. And that's what fascinated me and still fascinates me about pinhole photography. Is Photography is a form of mediation and it's, a lot of people don't realize, but it's very much deceptive. Photography is a deceptive medium because it looks like on the superficial level that it is uh, unmediated reality. That is, photography has a certain veracity to it that it appears to be real, but it's really not. Uh, everything about photography, where you choose to put the four lines of of the boundary of the frame is an editorial decision. When you choose to push the shutter button is an edit editorial decision. So you are editing time and space when you take a photograph and so it, it by definition it's manipulative but it looks like uh, unmanipulated reality when you look at the image as a viewer and that's kind of what fascinates me about pinhole is it takes on a certain amount of unmediation there's a certain amount of unmediation involved because the way the imaging device works One thing that fascinates me about silver gelatin media like photo paper negatives and black and white film and pinhole cameras combined together is it really does work as a, a very basic primal medium. Light hits the paper, you develop it and wherever the light hits it turns it dark and the simple projection optics of the pinhole aperture is 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 a basic elemental in principle it's it's so basic that it's been known about for thousands of years without even having to understand physics or how light works or what light is we know that light appears to be traveling in straight lines and that's how pinhole cameras seem to work but uh, there's something really fascinating about that simplicity uh, and the fact that you can get so close to an object with pinhole cameras. I think uh, there's a lot yet to be done with the medium.
I wonder where pinhole photography will be in a decade from now. I seem to sense that more and more it's kind of a gimmick. It's perceived as a gimmick uh, because it's so dependent on its quality for the size of the sensor, the size of the film plane. And even the best digital sensors, the largest digital sensors, are really inadequate in size to really get the kind of quality that you can get with something like an 8 by 10 inch film negative. And so, as we move away from these ultra large size uh, film based sensors, pinhole photography is kind of going to die. It's going to become more and more just a historic. Um, affectation that people dig out of the drawer once a year and kind of play with as kind of a of a gimmick but I think the resurgence of interest in pinhole photography is kind of gone I think it's faded and uh, people are uh, moved on to other things and uh, I hope that people can rediscover pinhole photography in a new way going in the future and maybe by keeping film alive and keeping photo paper and silver gelatin media alive, we can do something with it. One of the things I really enjoyed about working with pinhole photography was the fact that the cameras are so easy to build. You can basically make any container, if you can make it light tight with black paint or black tape or something, or you can make your own box out of uh, gaffer's tape and uh, cardboard or foam core board and then just throw a sheet of photo paper in it and you have your camera. You can make the pinhole out of a sheet of metal or brass or whatever. There, It's just real elemental kind of craft type skills involved. And there's a lot of people that have made real fancy woodworked pinhole cameras, but the, the image quality has little or nothing to do with how fancy the enclosure looks. It only has to do with how well made the pinhole is and how the film or paper was processed and exposed. That's really the only thing that matters as far as quality of exposure and quality of image. So it really is kind of a, a great leveler there's kind of a great leveling of the playing field technologically. Unlike with digital photography where the quality of your results is often based on how big your pocketbook is, uh, with pinhole it's more, much more about the interaction between you and the materials and how you work with that. And it's a lot more rewarding in that sense uh, in terms of the hands-on interaction. This last Sunday in April is Worldwide Pinhole Photography Day and a day when a lot of people around the world are celebrating pinhole photography by going out and making pinhole images. And I think it's a great thing that we don't forget pinhole photography. But the thing that saddens me in some ways is that for most people they only work with pinhole photography at most one day a year, which is this day. And ideally, what I'd like to see is someone who works with pinhole photography every day of the year. And for them, Worldwide Pinhole Photography Day would be a day where you take a break, or take a fast or a Sabbath from pinhole photography because you've been doing it the other 364 days of the year. That, to me, would be more meaningful because it would mean that the art of pinhole photography is truly alive and well. One thing that fascinates me about pinhole photography is how there's this dichotomy between how simple the process appears to be in many people's minds to how technical you can be involved in in order to get good results. 
when you mention pinhole photography to a lot of people, they'll say something like, oh, I did that as a kid. That's nothing. You know, that's just kids' play, and they kind of dismiss it as kids' play. But in order to actually get really good results, it's not child's play at all. You really have to work at understanding the media and the camera and the pinhole itself. And there, that's an interesting dichotomy, and I think it's part of the reason why so many people underappreciate pinhole photography. Because to get good results, you do have to work at it. And you also kind of have to understand what good means, how you measure that. Because uh, it's not all uh, super sharp. And there's a lot of people that do get involved with trying to pursue uh, uh, the sharpest possible image with pinhole. And that's not necessarily its forte, although you can get a surprisingly sharp image from a large format sheet film that's been contact printed. But um, that's not the primary reason why we do pinhole photography. And so there are other attributes of the image that we appreciate about it other than just sharpness. Shadows fascinate me. You have this light field from the sun in this case passing through leaves and branches of a tree and impinging upon the side of my shed and it sort of casts an image of the leaves and branches that it passes through shadow puppets the play of light upon the surface So on this Sunday, this Worldwide Pinhole Photography Day, I want to encourage you guys to try your hand at pinhole photography, even if it's nothing more than slapping a pinhole body cap on a digital camera, or uh, make your own pinhole camera out of a cardboard box, or a cigar box, or a craft box, and try your hand at developing black and white photo paper and see what you can come up with. Uh, it, it's a wonderful medium and it has a lot of potential that has yet to be tapped. Until next time, you have yourselves a great day.